We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this a while. Free our mind. My corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. Uh, hello there, and welcome to the Irish Side of the Moon. My name is Tommy O'Loughlin, and uh, tonight I'll be talking to uh, a lady called Dale Patterson. More about that in a moment. Let me just tell you about last week's guest, uh, a very interesting chap called Gerald Salente. He's a trend expert, trusted worldwide as the foremost authority on forecasting, analyzing, and tracking trends. He is the chief executive of the Trends Research Institute, Institute, beg your pardon, and publisher of the Trends Journal, author of Trends 2000 and Trend Tracking. Trend Tracking. Try saying that uh, after a few pints. Um, this week's guest, as I said, is uh, Dale Peterson. She has written a book called The Little Book of Shocking Food Facts. Uh, she is not, by trade, uh, a food writer, or indeed by trade a writer. She's, she's a background in business, a master's degree in business administration from the University of British Columbia. Um, she travelled around the world with her family, actually, and this kind of nurtured her passion for food and the understanding of the power of diet and nutrition. And today, as a result of that, she's pursuing a career in food, nutrition and, and natural health. <laughs> Very lovely lady, very nice to, to, to speak to, I must say, a very enjoyable interview. Um, and, and she's dealing with stuff that we all know about, but at the same time, we know about it, but we don't seem to be very um, exercised about it, so I suppose it's one more to add to the pile, maybe, to, to shock us. The book, I know, is available in Ireland, no problem, available all over the world, I presume, at this stage, in all good bookstores or online. Check it out anyway, I know it's available on Amazon and all the rest of those big ones, so, so you should definitely check that out. Okay, Dale. Um, welcome to the Irish Side of the Moon, and it's good to have you. Uh, we're talking tonight, of course, to you about your book, The Little Book of Shocking Food Facts. That's right. But before we get into the book, um, I'd like to get an idea, basically, of your background, that before you got involved with this project, uh, what was Dale Peterson doing with herself? Well, prior to that, a long, long time ago, I was uh, an accountant and a business owner, became an entrepreneur. And that doesn't really have much to do with uh, writing a book. And uh, then I became uh, a parent to two sons, and that doesn't have much to do with it either. Yeah, but it's all, always interesting. <laughs> That's right. And but it but it's interesting because it does all come together. Um, I also had a very passionate hobby, still do, as a, a foodie. I love food, studying it, cooking it, learning about it, and that led naturally into uh, an interest in nutrition and. That, in turn, led to an interest in natural health and some courses in that direction. And basically, that's the background that I brought to the table with uh, Field Publishing to uh, to write the book. So I guess it's safe to say that it's a pretty multifaceted background. I imagine that uh, the kids thing probably would have added to your whole interest in the idea of safe food and good food and, 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 and proper nutrition because as a father myself, I know that it's one of the biggest things that you, you think about and you suddenly start thinking about food in a much bigger way, don't you, when, when you have kids and when you're, when you're actually feeding them and trying to give them as much nutrition as they possibly can get. It's, it's very true. There's a, there's a lot of choices that you begin to make, not just for yourself anymore, but now you're feeding developing brains and growing bodies and you want to make sure that you're putting the right things in there to get the right things out. Do you ever come across this? Uh, the, uh, I remember when my wife was uh, reading up on, on, on stuff like this, she discovered the the incredible properties of the, I think you guys call it the sweet potato? The sweet potato, yes. Yes, yeah, that's right. Well, over oh, it's it's only kind of caught on over here in the last five six years. You you wouldn't nobody would have known what to do with them uh, until about five years ago. But uh, we're roasting them and we're <laughs> frying them and we're doing everything with them lately. We're doing they're, the same. Uh, we're doing the same. They're showing up in all sorts of shapes and forms and recipes. Yeah, that's good. They're an amazing food. Anyway, um, moving on a little bit. Um, how did you get involved with this project? I mean, uh, and, and meeting uh, Greg Holden Fe Feinberg, or Feinberg, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Um, don't tell me your eyes met across a crowded room and so began the little book that is causing big waves. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Actually, Craig and I have not even met, to be honest with you. But Really? We, really. We've uh, wow. communicated a lot. 
but we just haven't uh, met. In this technology world that we live in, we just haven't needed to, and I really look forward to the, uh, the opportunity to do that one of these days. But my involvement with the project came from the publishing side, from the PLs, uh, Charlene and Peter, mm-hmm. who I've known for a number of years. And it turned out that uh, a few years ago when they were starting up their publishing company, I happened to run into them socially, and because we'd known each other for quite a long time, they knew my background, knew my interests, knew the nutritional side of things, and I guess in the back of their minds, they had this idea for the the series of shocking fact books. Uh, The food facts is only one of four, and they were kind enough to uh, present me with the opportunity of writing the little book of shocking food facts. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity, and that's that's how it came about. Uh, is it the sort of thing that takes a, a huge amount of research, or does it sort of just? Uh, obviously, you had an, as, as a foodie yourself, uh, you would have had an interest, uh, and you would have had some information. But I, I can imagine that, that t- tackling something like that must have taken a long time. Was this a, a year-long process, a two-year-long process, or was it fairly quick? It was uh, very concentrated and very intense, but your thought at the the beginning of your comment is completely accurate. It took a tremendous amount of research. And again, as you mentioned, the interest in nutrition had me thinking along a few lines already. I had some ideas of directions that I might have wanted to uh, to highlight certain things that I felt were important. And then as the research unfolded, well, in particular, what happened was a, a box of books landed on my doorstep. There was about 25 to 30 books that the CLs were kind enough to put together for me to start the research process. And as I started reading through them, there started to be a series of threads and themes that began popping up over and over again, even though the authors were very different and the subject matter was very different. So it became very clear that there was a large-scale story out there, and it became a little bit frustrating that my my goal or my directions were basically to tell it one fact at a time. But uh, it's it's fascinating to know that there's just a wealth of information out there, and it's all very valuable as well. And uh, it probably was about six months of intensive research to pull it together on my end. Does it ever, does it ever frustrate you? You said there's a wealth of information out there. Does it ever, ever frustrate you, as it often does with me on, on various topics, that I often feel that a large percentage of the population, particularly of the Western world, who are well-educated, who are supposedly knowledgeable, don't seem to have access or else don't want to be bothered with accessing the information that's out there, the the jarring facts about the world that we live in. Does that ever frustrate you? It frustrates me terribly. I could sit and have a conversation for hours on one or two of these little nuggets of information, and yet... To the casual observer, they just really couldn't give it another, you know, a, a second of thought, quite literally. And um, yet, I think it's very valuable. Just yeah, yeah. I I often think about that. One of the reasons I I often find that I often sort of the conclusions I often come to is kind of we've become uh, almost a tabloid esque type. Um, 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 mindset in the sense that we, we we can only deal with small pieces of information at a time as they're fed to us almost by whether it be the powers that be or 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 or, or, or some kind of um, a government sort of uh, group or government sort of uh, dictum and uh, we're we're kind of happy just to take the information as it's given to us but no more and and we don't want to investigate do you, do you ever find that people just don't want to know don't want to bother investigating they're not, they're not they're not exercised by it i i find that i think it's very very true and i'm not like that myself i do like going in search of information so i don't fully understand that kind of a mindset but maybe it takes both kinds because if i can go out there and research it and present it to them in a way that they can absorb one bite at a time, so to speak, then we're both happy. You know, I, I can get the information out there that I think is valuable and they can just digest it as, as it comes to them. Would you like a little ego boost? Who wouldn't? <laughs> Who wouldn't? Are you sure? Well, I can give you a little quote. I can tell you that working with Dale on the content has been an amazing experience, truly a dream client. And that is attributed to Craig Holden Feinberg. Wow. Thank That's you, nice, Craig. Thank you, Craig. 
I found that on a, on a ver- I, in the course of my research, I found that in a, a very a strange little paper. Well, it's strange to me because it's called the Denver Egotist. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. No, I haven't, but I know he was living uh, there at one point, yes. We right, and this was a, a a thread of a conversation that uh, he was having with, uh, obviously, a fan, somebody who admired the book greatly and admired his work. But the funny thing for us over here when we were researching this, I have to tell you, is that there's a slogan that goes with the Denver Egotist right up beside their um, their masthead. It says, um, helping Denver suck less daily. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, on this side of the pond, that has a whole different meaning. Um <laughs> I take it in Denver, they're not allowed to have any lollipops, but anyway, that's okay. <laughs> Still, it's, not, <laughs> it's nice to hear that. Okay, if we that move is, on. That's lovely to hear. I'm, I have to email Craig and uh, thank him for yeah, that. Yeah, it's a nice thing. Yeah, I thought it was lovely. Now, he also mentioned Charlotte and, and, and Peter in that, and I just kind of bracketed them out for the, for the sake of it. But he, he, did, he, he clearly must have enjoyed the experience, so it's, ni- it's nice to know that, I think. I think we were all very gratified by the experience. And at the outset, it's probably safe to say that Craig and, well, maybe all four of us, but uh, I certainly, and I possibly Craig, really didn't know what we were getting in on. And uh, I, I guess it became sort of a, a living, breathing thing as we moved along through the process. And uh, I think we all had fun with it. Okay, well, we've talked enough about the sort of background about it. How about we move on to some of the actual facts that are contained in this book? Can you Can you give us an idea, for those of us who can't get a hold of it yet or who haven't got a hold of it yet, I've had a look at it myself, some of it. Um, what kind of shocking fact should we expect to read about? I, I would guess that you could find them in a few different categories. Uh, there are good facts and bad facts. There are things that I hope will be very empowering to people in the sense of understanding just what amount of control they really do have over their health, first and foremost. But and their family's health, but also over the planet and its health. And I don't think people will realize the extent of the impact that they can have, not just in their neighborhood, but also literally around the world. So that's the the good shocking part. I think there's also uh, a bad shocking part. Again, I don't think people realize quite exactly the extent of some of the damage that's being done. And... I wouldn't say that we're, we, you know, the consumers out there are doing this intentionally. And I think if we knew better, we probably wouldn't be doing it at all. But there are powers that be, there are decision makers out there that are making these decisions that are having horrendous impact on the environment and on other populations and on farmers and on the poorest of the poor, for example, that are just devastating. And there are things that we should all know about that and we should think about whenever we eat our next meal or shop for our next bag of groceries. I think it's uh, it's becoming more and more important that we accept sure. that responsibility. Sure. Um, I'm going to quote, uh, I've got a couple of quotes here from the book because kind of like, I want to actually see if you can elucidate a little bit on them and explain them to Absolutely. our listeners because they're, they're, they are quite shocking. Well, the first one I'm going to give you is um, food security is one of the most pressing issues facing humanity. Yes. And whether we want to face it or not, we have less and less assurance of food availability. Can you explain what you, you know, give me some detail on that. I can. Um, I guess from the food availability standpoint, uh, we don't really control uh, what is in the grocery store, for example. So we might go there to buy a dozen eggs and whether or not they're, the right dozen of eggs is not something that we're controlling. There's someone that goes a few levels back making that decision for us. So even if you're looking around at 50,000 available products, there's you don't have as much choice over those as you might think you have. So that's one sense of food availability, that it's it's an illusion that you uh, that's out there. And then the other aspect of it is uh, sustainability. So it just because something is available today does not mean it's going to be available tomorrow. And probably a good example of that are the fish stocks in the ocean. So uh, sustainability is another uh, aspect of that. Another uh, third aspect is the idea of natural disasters, climate change, global warming, call it what you want. But there are some very real instances of 
horrible, tragic things happening that wipe out whole crops of food for very poor populations and put them in a near state of collapse when they happen. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned the fish thing there. Um, can you can you can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, you were throwing away fish. Well, there are two aspects of it of the fish uh, availability. One is just the overfishing of already scarce species. Uh huh. And uh -huh. you know, as long as we continue to buy those, they'll continue to fish them. So once we become more aware of the fact that they're endangered, and we stop buying them, because now we know better then we can give those species a chance to regenerate and hopefully become plentiful again. So that's one aspect of the, the fish thing. And the second is the, the bycatch. There's two different facts in the book about that, and I don't remember the numbers right offhand, but basically... Oh, that's it, okay. Just uh, give, yeah. us a, give us a, yeah, sure. a general picture. In order to trawl for shrimp, basically you have these, these commercial vessels that just scrape along the bottom of the seabed and then they pick up whatever they pick up. All they really want are the shrimp and the other 80% or whatever it is of what they've caught is just tossed back in or thrown away as garbage. And so not only are they just devastating the, the ocean bed, but they're also killing wantonly as they grab their few hundred pounds of shrimp. Wow. That is uh, that is scary. And you think, I mean, obviously it's hard to remember all the facts because I know it's a book full of facts and numbers and statistics, but you think it could be up to as much as 80% of, 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 of waste, of rubbish. I, I think it could be, yeah. Wow, I think that's incredible. Yeah. Um, I'm, going to throw another, I'm going to throw another quote at you. Every year in the United States, up to 25 million pounds of antimicrobial drugs. Yes. Anti antibiotics, antivirals, antifungal, Correct. antiparasitics, are fed to livestock yes. for non-therapeutic purposes. <laughs> this is not to make them better. This is just food. Right. Why? What's going on? What's Isn't that the, what's the I, uh, yeah, I ended up uh, feeling a little bit depressed after some days of research, I must say, and that's, that's certainly one of them. They, they raise cattle these days in, I don't know the exact terminology, I think they call them factory farm lots. And basically, they pen them very, very close together. You have thousands and thousands of head of cattle all being raised in very close proximity to each other. They can't really this walk around like, freely. This is like almost like the battery hen situation, but yes, if they're it doing is. it with cups. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Slight, slightly Sorry. more humane, but only slightly. And so as a result of that, whatever sorts of pathogens are around are very easily transmitted from one to the next. So in order to keep a handle on that and to keep the the cattle healthy, they have to give them these antimicrobials as a preventive measure in order to make sure that they don't contract whatever's out there. They're stepping around, you know, you know, they're probably ankle high in a lot of things that we would not even want to know about. And so the chance of them contracting something is very high. My God. Now, are we eating this meat? <laughs> <laughs> are we um, drinking the milk? I, I think we know the answer to that. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. Isn't that something? I, I, used, I, I used to feel a little bit suspicious about vegetarians. I, I might be changing my mind now. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. there are some alternatives to that, too. I don't think it has to be one or the other. But, I, again, I think it's a, a matter of awareness and becoming informed. And by doing that, we, we can affect the change that we want to see. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I have a great big one here. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a long-winded one, but it's... Uh, it, it's, a, it's a whopper. The specter of creating antibiotic resistant microbes is virtually unavoidable when animals and humans are given the same antimicrobials, particularly the ones that are the most important in a human medicine. Now, this risk is magnified enormously when you consider the sheer volume of the pharmaceuticals being used. Now, tell me if I'm getting this right. Basically, in short, antibiotics are soon going to be practically useless because we have, we've messed around so much that the baddies can't beat the beginnings out of it, can, can be, sorry, can be the beginnings out of any antibiotic we throw at them. I think that's part of it. I, I don't have a strong enough background uh, knowledge to really be able to speak uh, as an expert on that. But one of the things I came across in the research was a huge concern that these millions of pounds that we're talking about of antibiotics or antimicrobials 
are the same ones that are being given to humans to fight a lot of the bugs that we are combating. And I think the implication of that was if we were given different strains of antibiotics, we would really reduce the possible resistance that we might see down the road. Um, yeah. So uh, ultimately, ultimately, it would seem that antibiotics won't work after a while because um, they become yeah. useless. I, I think Is that that's, right? I think that's the implication. If we're wow. all being, if we're all using the uh, the antibiotics, even for non-therapeutic reasons, we're reducing its effectiveness. We're using our big guns for non-therapeutic reasons and kind of wasting the possible impact they could have when we really need them. I think that's the implication from it. Yeah, that's extraordinary. It that's is. extraordinary. It is. Um, moving on, I started sticking with the agricultural idea. The agricultural industry uses 1,200 million pounds of pesticides over the course of a year in the U.S. alone. Pesticide use has tripled in the previous 30 years from a level of 400 million pounds in the mid-1960s. And the U.S. accounts for almost one-third of worldwide sales, or, in other words, $11 billion. Now, I, I don't want you to, there's, there's no explain, explanation necessary with something like that, but one of the things that struck me again when I was reading this and I was <clears throat> uh, doing the research, I'm sure you've seen the same documentaries that I've seen concerning the dangers to, to, to bees and consequently the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, have you touched on this area in the book much? With regard to bees in particular? D to bees and and, no. and the consequences of of their demise. Have you have you no. have have you any thoughts on that? No, unfortunately, that didn't uh, that didn't cross its way into any of the the research that I did. But I know they are they're endangered. They're endangered here as well. The honeybee population in particular, and I wasn't aware of the link with pesticides, quite frankly. But uh, it, it stands to reason that it would yeah. be a problem, yeah. and I'm sure it's one of many aspects of the uh, the dangers of that much pesticide use out there. And then you think of it filtering its way down into the groundwater and that becomes our drinking water. And it's also making its way through into the oceans. And just to take the thread a little bit further, there's another fact that talks about a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's the size of New Jersey from I believe primarily the ag the agricultural runoff from things like pesticides, and it's basically an an area that's huge where nothing can grow. There's no oxygen in that water that can support life. There's nothing there. So, the more this level of use continues, presumably the larger that do dead zone will become. What does that Get mean? It, again, I, again, it makes you it makes you wonder why why we're not a heck of a lot more exercised about this. Yes. Anyway, well, there's probably interests out there that would prefer we not know as much as. Ah, uh, well, yes, there, <laughs> there, there is the rub. Yes. Um, okay, uh, moving away a little bit from this uh, incredibly depressing area <laughs> of uh, <laughs> of discussion, um, let's get back to you a little bit. Okay, you have a business background, as you as you said at the start of the show. Um, you're a foodie, and now food is becoming, and the whole issue around food and, and health and all of that is starting to become very important in your life. Uh, what's your next project? Well, it's it's. I'm thinking about uh, another book project, but I haven't really taken any firm directions in that uh, in that regard. But uh, a number of years ago, when this opportunity was first presented to me to do this book I was actually in the middle of a world trip with my husband and family and we spent 14 months going around the world and it was a wonderful you know life life dream come true and it was a, a great thing and so I always had in the back of my mind to write a book about it <laughs> and I took a lot of notes along the trip and a lot of photos with that in mind so now that this one is off to uh, off to the side and taking on a life of its own. I'm thinking of breathing some life into a new one, and uh, that was the idea that I always had in the back of my mind. So I just might uh, do something with that. Yeah, um, would there be a particular theme running through this? Is it like a travel book? Is it just a, 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 I say just? Um, is it no, is it a, a kind of more more? There would be a theme. My younger son has special needs, and right. so it's often considered very challenging for a family to travel with a child who has special needs. 
And so I wanted to put that as the central focus in order to inspire other families to take on maybe not the same level of challenge. I don't know if I would recommend it for everyone, but but by the same token, just to broaden their world a little bit more and not be um, afraid to do that, and that it broadens everyone, so to speak. That sounds that sounds extraordinary, actually, uh, and a good idea. I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in that myself, although it's not particularly the the, the subject that we're covering tonight, because I, I have an, uh, a background in education myself, and oh. I have worked with with students of uh, with special needs. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I'd be interested to know how, how that went. I mean, I don't know the obviously the details, and, and that's uh, uh, not not really the, the, the listener's business um, in terms of, of of the 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 learning difficulties of of, of your son. But um, how 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 did he react? Actually, I'd be very keen to know how. how I, I would imagine actually that he may have embraced it completely. Well, some aspects of it he embraced, but it was. In a very large sense, a start-to-finish sense, I think it was a little bit of an exercise of him coming to terms with the fact that, you know, he had to do things a certain way in order to operate in the world, so to speak. And I think uh, the flip side to that coin was that the world had to understand that there's a population of kids out there who have these special needs and that they, too, need to adjust their way of thinking. So that that was one of the big takeaways for me was that um, there was a little a little bit of learning to happen on both sides. Sure. Was, uh, uh, you know, you can I can bring this right back into the topic we've been discussing because we're just discussing because that's exactly what's going on here. Uh, the world needs to sort of well, according to the, your book, the world needs to sort of wake up and and realize that there's an awful lot of stuff going on that we're either not aware of or right. choose not to be aware of. Correct. Hmm. That's exactly right. Are there, and, is there and any it's other, out are, there. It's out there. You and I know about it, and it's sure. the sort of thing that you almost take for granted that everybody not, does know about, but presumably they don't. Yeah, it's, it's not that long ago, you know, since they were still hiding the, the 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 child with the special needs in the house and pretending that they didn't exist in the public world. It's amazing. Yes, very true, very true. And so that's okay. The Let's idea. wants to address that. Yeah, yeah. Let's get back to you for a moment. Um, in terms of the uh, publishing of this book, what did what do you think that Dale Peterson brought to the project that no one else could? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't want to say that no one else could. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are a lot of people that could easily have uh, taken on this project as well. But I think the package that is my background is maybe a little bit unique, and that's why I mentioned the, the multifaceted aspect of it. And it, it it probably came together in the sense that uh, I had some background natural health knowledge and nutritional knowledge, so I was able to bring that in. Uh, not that this knowledge is you know unique or proprietary or anything, but um, it gave me a starting point, sort of a, a launching point to uh, to use in order to move it forward. Then I would probably also say that the passion I have about it is also important. It's not really something that I was doing just to while away the hours or anything like that. It's something that I feel very strongly about. And I think there's a part of me that uh, really enjoys that research aspect. I like digging into information and getting a little bit deeper, especially when it's something that I uh, I enjoy reading about. And Super. Yeah. And I think the entrepreneur in me is... Uh, by definition, uh, an independent thinker, and I think that was important to to bring to the project as well because these facts had to be gleaned from a lot of different areas, and uh, they didn't sort of exist in one package before, not to my knowledge anyways. So I think I brought that to uh, to the project and probably the travel experience I mentioned earlier. I think that had some bearing on it as well. I think it's... Uh, it's eye-opening to see what's out there and bring it into the project as well. Yeah. Are, are you pleased with the finished product? I'm thrilled with it. I'm thrilled with it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's uh, good. Was, that's, a, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm, um, you know, I was just reviewing it again in, uh, in anticipation of our interview, and I just had to shake my head all over again just because it's uh, it was just such a tremendous experience, and I'm very proud of the the final product. Um, 
Craig's graphic art is just it's so bold, it's so dramatic, and it really supports the, the shocking nature of the book, so to speak, and just puts it right out there. So uh, I think that's absolutely fantastic. As a matter of fact, I heard through the Fiels not too long ago that on the basis of Craig's art, the, the book is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, in the bookstore. You're joking me. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's what I was told. So that's, that's fantastic. That's an incredible um, achievement for Craig, and he should be very proud of that. That's great. Yeah, and that you. is wonderful. And I, and, and I, but it's not, in the museum. It. it's not in the yeah. Museum of Modern Art because of my food facts. <laughs> yeah, but it wouldn't have been if you hadn't if you hadn't put the copy together. He wouldn't be able to, uh, he'd be designing nothing. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the other aspect of it that I'm very proud of in terms of the final product is the fact that even though it's it's a book that puts out one fact at a time, I I like to think that at the beginning of the book, there's a little write-up that really ties it together into a worthwhile story that's worth the time to grasp, if you know what I mean. So uh, it's easy to take in, but there is a big global message to the book. And so I'm very happy about the way that ended up because it really didn't start that way. Is it accessible to to all? I mean, again... I think of teenagers, and I think of because of, yeah. of, of, uh, they're they're the one group that uh, can be quite obsessive about the whole idea of food, and it becomes a big issue. Um, I think is teenagers it that, are a great market for this book. Uh, I, really, I think they are because it's well suited to their uh, relatively short attention spans. <laughs> it's got very interesting images, and there's a lot of information in the back as well. There's these expanded write-ups where one can go to for a little bit more information, as well as the actual study that it came from. So, for example, if they were using this for research or for their knowledge, they they can get hold of that um, toward the back of the book as well. So I think teenagers would make a great market for this. Would it scare them? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> just just Very in the good. sense that uh, I think we need to be scared. I think that's that's exactly what has to happen. Uh, not, not really scared in the sense of losing sleep, but shocked. You know, that's that's the intent. And I think after you become shocked, you realize you've become informed. And, and after you're informed, then you can act. But we have to get their attention first. Yeah, that that can be that can be quite difficult exactly. sometimes. But no, yeah, but it was good. Uh, the cover of the book should certainly uh, grab their attention anyway. It is quite a, <laughs> quite a striking. I was a little bit worried because I, I kind of like little gingerbread men, and I was a bit worried about that. But that's okay. Uh, for the <laughs> sake of the listeners, I, I should I should explain that the uh, the book has a, a, a beautiful little gingerbread man. Um, um, the backing behind that is this brilliant, shocking pink. Isn't it though? So I, yes. Yeah, it's 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 quite a yeah. It'd catch your eye in a bookstore for sure. Sure, no question I, about it. I think that might have had something to do with the, the color choice. I can't take any credit for that um, at all, but I agree with you. It is shocking in and of itself. Okay, let's get into the message of the, of the book itself. First of all, just again, although we've, we've kind of touched on it a couple of times during the interview, what's the format of the book? The format of the book is basically one part graphic art and one part shocking content. And it's, as I mentioned, it's one of a series of books that the CL Publishing has put out, and I think they all follow that same format. And at the beginning of the book, as I mentioned, is a story that I hope ties it all together. And at the end of the book is a little bit more inf- information that goes beyond a, a single sentence and also the source of the information so that people can track it down if they like. And I, I think it's also worth mentioning that a lot of this is available on the internet. There are research research articles that have been published on the internet and are available. So in many, many cases, it's not a matter of having to track down an elusive book or anything like that. The information is readily available if anybody wants to find it. So, um, yeah, that's basically the, the format of the book. Yeah, I suppose it could be. It could be. I mean, I, I I mentioned in a kind of derogatory term earlier on the tabloid tabloid kind of tabloid esque style. Yeah. But I don't mean that in this kind. Of, but it, it is a kind of a tabloid esque style in yes. the sense that the information is given in small bites. Is that correct? Yes. 
It is. And yeah. do you think that this might is the reasoning behind that? I presume was to try and have more impact in in, in the kind of busy world that we live in t- That's today. That's exactly right. It takes. We probably get maybe a millisecond of someone's attention before they're moving on to the next thing, and so the opportunity to grab them is pretty limited. And I think it will take a visual image to grab them, and then some shocking information, some shocking content to at least keep them engaged for a rel- you know, long enough to get them to understand whether or not they agree with what that is or whether they want to research it further or whether they just want to move on with life and you know, turn the page. Sure. And I suppose the short, sharp facts are, are probably a more powerful tool than the long out speech, long drawn out speeches. But at the same time, if, if they want to have the long, longer articles, you, you say at the back of the book, yes. it's all there for them to take, a, to, go, to take it to the next step. It's all there. There's either a little bit more information if that's all they're looking for, or there's a, a path to take them to the source of the information where they can go find out for themselves exactly what was the, the source of what we were trying to uh, bring across to them. And then sure. they can make their own decisions or become informed in, in that particular way. Yeah. When did you yourself get to see the designs of, of Craig Holden Feinberg? Uh, was it a finished product or was this an ongoing thing? A bit of both, actually. Um, my first uh, exposure to, to Craig's work was when there was a team effort to come up with the cover design for the book. And so Craig would send over these series of design concepts and we all got to see them. I was the only one of the group that had really never been exposed to, uh, exposed to Craig's work before, so it was all new to me. And uh, every one was just a treat to open up the new image and see his, <laughs> his next version of what it was going to look like. And every single one of them were great, of course. And we as a group came to a consensus on one, and that just got put off to the side, and then we moved along with the project. And then I got a final look at the book, and it was not the same image. <laughs> so somewhere along the way, the ginger oh. red man uh, became the, the cover of the book. So I, I'm not quite sure when and how that happened, but um, all you're the other design concepts were equally great. They were, yeah. they were wonderful. But you're not, you're, not, you're not disappointed with the cover of the book? Not at all. No, not at no. all. I think it's great. And I had... Uh, other glimpses of Craig's work. I, I, what would happen is I would send him a batch of facts, so to speak. So I would do the research, come up with, let's say, 10 or 12, and then send them off to him, and then he would do his images, and then they would, uh, they would come back. And then a certain way along the process, maybe two-thirds of the way, I got, I got really taken with, uh, with one of them. And uh, it, was the, it had to do with the fact on grass-fed beef. And I think in the book it's about page 92 and if you look at it it's an image of a cow and the cow is constructed of these blades of grass and in this cut and paste world that we lived in that we live in I should say I just had this impression that Craig must have just taken a blade of grass and cut and pasted it all throughout this image of a cow and so we were just chatting on the phone one day and I said wow it's really great I love it Uh, tell me, is this how you did it? And he said, oh, no, no, that's not at all how I did it. And he went on to explain a very painstaking process that, if I remember correctly, got him up at about 5 o'clock in the morning to get a a specimen of earth that was just the right texture and color and moisture. And and then on top of that, he, he put these individual blades of grass. So that work is very painstaking that he's done in that image. It's not at all cut and paste it's true graphic art so i was gosh it really sounds like he he really goes to town on it doesn't it <laughs> i was very impressed i was very impressed. yeah i think i would be too in fairness i, I think i would be um the book is printed on what i i just read in my uh, and i wasn't quite sure what it was all about and i've researched it a little bit but it's quite interesting it's printed on something called fsc certified paper what's that about well that's a good question um uh, i really was not involved uh, in that part of the book, but um, as did you, I looked it up a little bit, and I understand that the FSC component stands for the Forest Stewardship Council. And so it's a certification that allows the reader to uh, feel that uh, Field Publishing has acted in a very corporately responsible way to bring this product to them. So there's a certification that each step 
uh, what they call the chain of custody that the paper has moved through. So, for example, from tree to paper, at every step along the way, the processor or supplier also has to be FSC certified in order to bring you a product that has an overall certification. So that was uh, very responsible the way I uh, saw it, and it supports so the an actual. Level. I'm sorry? Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, in actual fact, this, this little pink book is actually a very green book. <laughs> I guess you could say that. It's a little bit like the uh, certified organic of the publishing world, I guess. Now, this is uh, an area that maybe you might not have too much knowledge on, but I would be curious. Can, can you tell me, or do you know at the moment, how are sales? Well, there's another great question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I, I really oh, that's, don't. That's, that's okay. It's not really your field. You wrote the book. It's up to the publishers to take care of that, I suppose. Well, yes. Um, I, I would like to know. So. Yeah, I'd, 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 we'd like to know, but I imagine yeah. it's probably doing doing quite well. I would hope so. Absolutely. So. All right. Okay. Moving on a little bit to, um, you know, the other side. Some listeners might be wondering, you know, this is all very sweet and, and good and nice and all of this, but... Um, at first glance, all the jarring facts and, and the blunt graphics in the little book of, of shocking facts may seem like nothing more than scare tax, tactics. Is that, is that a fair uh, criticism? I, I guess it probably is in the sense that it's, uh, it, it's meant to shock to get attention, I think, more than to scare. And as I said, I don't think anybody wants anyone to stay up at night, you know, having an anxiety attack over any of this. But uh, it's shock value with the intent of informing and engaging and then ultimately having people embrace and then act on some of the information should they choose to make it a part of their own value system, so to speak. Yeah, but at the same time, I suppose the the intent, even though it is scare tactics, it's still intended to be constructive. I suppose in the end, and, and at the Absolutely, end of the day, absolutely, it's meant to be constructive. Yeah, and you sure. know, there is plenty to be shocked about. <laughs> There's no lack of things in there to uh, to shock. And and you know, what's also interesting is that nothing in there has been invented or put out there to be anything other than than what it is. It's uh, research that has been drawn from a very reliable source and. So it's it's not as though we've conjured up um, a series of facts and figures that don't already exist. They do exist. We, we've just packaged them up and dressed them up and put them out there in a way to uh, get people to notice them. One of the things that has emerged at the moment, one of the big news stories around the world, is the whole WikiLeaks uh, issue. And within that, one of the um, leaks involves a... Uh, a condemnation of Europe's attitude in not embracing genetically modified foods. And the quote actually reads that Europe is moving backwards, not forwards on this issue, with France playing a leading role along with Austria, Italy, and even the European Commission. Moving to retaliation will make clear that the current path has real costs to EU interests and could help strengthen European pro-biotech voice. Now, what they're getting at basically is that they're, because Europe is not... Um, you know, embracing the whole genetically modified right. food issue, they're going to retaliate by making it more expensive for them to buy non-GM foods. Have you any views on that? I really don't know enough about the WikiLeaks aspect of it, but I think Europe is in a, a good position right now because they haven't started down that road yet, and they do have an opportunity to do it with eyes wide open. And that's probably what they should do. They should make sure that uh, they're satisfied with with the whole process before they do move it forward. And Because once you start down that road, it's very hard to turn back. I yeah, it's a lot a, of other things. And so this is a, a good opportunity for them to take a, a hard look at it. Uh, and then, it sounds to me like it's a kind of a healthy caution, really, isn't it? Sure, sure it is. It's, uh, it's, it's like a lot of the other messages in the book. It's a matter of being informed and making a decision for good reasons and for reasons that feel right to you, and you move forward on that basis. Yeah. Um, okay, another criticism that could uh, could be leveled at the whole book is that uh, the designer, and you have uh, yeah. praised him highly, as has he praised you, seems to be getting as much, if not more, publicity out of the book as you are. 
Uh, do you think that there's an argument there that maybe he was at cross purposes? No, not at all. Cross purposes, definitely not. No, this was very much a, a team effort, and as I mentioned, his the book is in the Museum of Modern Art, and it's there for some very good reasons, and they have everything to do with him. And as I say, people aren't there looking at the book uh, for the for the food content. So um, I I think the more attention he gets, the better. That's great, and he would probably say the same the other way around too. So it's all good. And as a matter of fact, really what it does is it brings two sets of markets together for one book, if you know what I mean. It's a little bit like uh, crossover recording artists bringing two demographics together. You know, we've got the graphic art world that uh, may want to have a look at the book for those reasons, as well they should. And on my end, you have the nutrition, environmentalist, concerned food citizen uh, market who may also want to have a look at the book for those reasons. So the more the merrier. So it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship, I suppose, then. I would think you could see it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this book hasn't been written before, but another book has been written. Uh, I came across a book called Naturally Dangerous, Surprising Food Facts About Health and the Environment. Sorry, oh. Surprising Facts About Food, Health and the Environment. It's a little book written by a chap called James P. Coleman. He's a renowned professor at Stanford University and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Wow. Um, yeah, and he says, it says, uh, the description of it says here, in a no-nonsense style targeted to someone without any science background, Coleman summarizes the science behind the issues of food, health and environment. It was published in 2001. And my question, I suppose, is why bother adding to the pile? Or is the, well, your book that's different? that's a good question. I think, there's, I think there's room out there for a lot of different books. I haven't read that one, but it sounds like the sort of book that I would like to read and the sort of book that I probably would have read as research for doing this one. Um, I think there's room out there for more than one book on any topic. Um, I think as you become interested in anything, you read dozens maybe of topics on uh, of books on a given topic. So, you know, if a, if a person was only going to buy one book, then I guess they need to research both of them and then decide which one is right for them. Um, but in the absence of that, I think there's no harm in having choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay. For our listeners, one of the parts of the show that we like to do is to, to consider what the listeners might like to do um, about this book or, or in relation to this book. The first question, how do you go about getting your own book off the ground? How, how do you do that? Wow. Uh, good question. I guess in my instance, it was probably what you would consider atypical in that the opportunity was presented to me and I didn't really have to go in search of it. So that, and I guess in a sense, is a little bit unique. But having been through the process and potentially looking at going through it again, what I would probably suggest is that they do a little bit of uh, digging around and researching to find a like-minded publisher. So depending on the content of what they want to write about or depending on their backgrounds or their style, I would suggest that they find um, someone out there who, who deals in a similar sort of a product. And then assuming that they are given the opportunity of a, a foot in the door, uh, I would suggest that they then make sure that whatever they have to present is as polished as it can be at that point so they can demonstrate that they've uh, they've done their end of of the work and how, you know how long how long did it how long actually i i i kind of uh, skirted around the question earlier on how long did the process t for you take in, in in doing this book or for all of you take how long how long was the process roughly from start to finish start to finish was i, I don't know how long it took for the actual printing of the book but i can you know, put an estimate in my mind. I would say start to finish was probably about a year from, uh, you know, standing around chatting about the idea for the book until the book started rolling off the rolling off the press. That My impression was it was somewhere around a year. So that's the, you know, the pre-research. Uh, before the research, there was the pre-research. <laughs> 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 and then there was, you know, the writing happened along the way and Craig's designs happened along the way as well and then it gets handed off and then the publishers do their end of things they they edit you know they decide the order of the book the order of the images what's staying what's going uh that sort of thing and there's probably a whole 
well, there is. There's a whole aspect to the process that I'm not even aware of that takes place on their end. So, uh, Did you the, enjoy the process? Oh, I loved it. Really? I loved it, yeah. There, w- there was a little bit of a dark period for me at the very beginning where I was wallowing in all this paper and all this research, and I had some directions to go in, but not enough. I knew I needed to come up with a lot more interesting information, and I really, it wasn't taking a shape in my head as to where this was going to go. And then once I got the idea of this image of the larger picture, and I started to see the common threads, it started to take on a shape of its own and a life of its own, and then I was just off and running. But uh, there was probably about two weeks where I was feeling a little bit uh, rudderless, shall we speak, shall we say. And uh, yeah. then it all came together. And it's probably that way with a lot of different projects. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that period because it made me appreciate just how much relief I felt <laughs> when I gained my momentum <laughs> and my movement and direction forward. And then I, I felt great. How about the actual writing process itself? Actually, I mean, you're ho- talking about this other book that you're hoping to get to to get yes. to, to get on the move. Right. Do you enjoy the writing process itself? I enjoy it. Now, I'm not a writer by background, as I mentioned to you. There's a number of things I have in my background, but writing is not one of them. And so that's daunting for me. And I guess it's something that I feel very self-conscious about. And um, maybe it makes me a little bit extra careful and I might spend more time on it than other people might because I do feel the need to, to get it right. But it doesn't come easily. Uh, sometimes it does. But uh, th- that's why this was such a, a great project for me because I didn't have to come up with a set of characters. You know, for example, if you think about writing a novel where you have a plot and you've got characters, and I, I didn't have to do any of that. I just had to do things that I love doing. Um, research, gleaning valuable information, packaging, putting it together. and So this worked out very, very well for me. Super. Um, do you have kind of a timetable that when, when, you, when you were working on the previous book, like are you a morning person, are you a working at night person, or are you just working whenever the kids are quiet and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, busy enough to give you time to get to the desk for a while? I found that I needed to be able to create chunks of time where I could put my blinkers on and really focus. I think it's very hard to get to a level of concentration and then be interrupted and then try to get back to that same level of concentration again. So whatever works for a given person in trying to structure their time, I think it's important to to do it in a way that um, is going to work for you in order to be able to get to that deep thought process. Um, For our listeners, again, uh, if you were to pick one really important thing that they'd need to understand about their diet, and this is, a, this is a toughie, what would that be? Well, it's actually not that tough, I don't think. I think there is a one thing. There's lots of things, but I think there is a one thing. It's not so much about diet, but it's about food in general. And I think it's important for people to understand that every time they shop or go to a restaurant, every time they spend their food dollars, they're actually voting. They're voting with their food dollars. And they do it three times a day, every single day. And I think it's important for them to appreciate that uh, and to understand that they really should be voting wisely and they should probably be voting voting in an informed way. And they've got an opportunity to be voting in a very informed way. And it's important for them, their families, for the planet. And it's really not an exaggeration to say that what they choose to spend their money on can have a lasting impact not just in their local area, but quite literally in other parts of the world. And I think it's also important for them to know that they can change the decisions that the food corporations are making on their behalf by voting in in an appropriate manner. Yeah, okay, we we vote by what we spend and what what we choose to buy. Okay, Um, is there any other way we can kind of get these 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 people a little bit scared? We don't want to scare them and and, and not have them have them sleepless nights. But uh, but you know to sort of make them wake up and realize, hang on a minute, we would like to have the good stuff, not the stuff that you makes you the most dollars. Well, I think that's what they have to start by buying. And it's out, it's out there. I mean, they can find, quote-unquote, the good stuff, as you put it, uh, what they want. And so they, 
it's in smaller supply, but they have to find that supply. If that's what they choose to do, they should seek it out and buy that. And again, they're using their food dollars to, to vote. And then so that supply will be increased and demand on the other side um, of the not so good stuff is going to decrease. And so eventually they're going to get the message that, oh, wait a second, that's where all the dollars are going. Wow, we better get in on that. And um, two things I would like to put out there that they should consider doing is firstly buying free-range eggs. You made a reference earlier to the cage laying hens, and I think sure, uh, sure. I think it's worth it to spend, you know, that little Why? little bit extra of money to know that you're really encouraging a much better lifestyle, much more humane lifestyle for these creatures that we've brought into being. And then the second thing I would also like to uh, to put out there is to buy fair trade whenever possible, because uh, it really makes a big difference to the farmers or the suppliers, the growers on the other end. Final question. Yes. Are you optimistic? I guess I have to say I am. I am. I, I would like to believe that people armed with the information that's in here uh, will more than likely change their patterns of buying, their patterns of approaching food, and I think the end result is going to be a change in a very positive direction. So in that sense, absolutely, I'm optimistic. Very good. Dale Peterson, I'd like to thank you very, very much on behalf of the Irish Side of the Moon and on my own behalf because I really have enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Uh, you've been really frank. It has been really nice. And um, I hope sometime we can talk to you again. That would be great. And uh, don't be, when you're traveling around the world the next time with your family, make sure you pop into Ireland for a little call. We did. We Excellent. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dale, and take care. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. That was brilliant. We, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Same here. Same here. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, um, about us. You should check us out on Facebook. We've audio clips. We've posts about absolutely everything from toxic dumping to global warming to 9-11, Irish politics. And I would like to say a particular thank you for the posts from Paul, Thomas, Charlie, Nigel, Mary, Terry, Frank, Robin, and Siobhan. Really good of them to take the time out to uh, to give their opinion and, and, and fire out a couple of more ideas. It's nice. We've got a good group growing up on Facebook, I, I, I heard recently um, at the last meeting, that over, over 900. So we'd like to say thank you to absolutely everyone. Now, next week's guest is a lady called Mary Holland who's the co-editor of Vaccine Epidemic, How Corporate Greed, Biased Science, and Coercive Government Threaten Our Human Rights, Our Health, and Our Children. Mary is a research scholar at uh, the NYU School of Law, and she's written and edited books and articles on human rights and law. It's actually a collection of essays, I think 24, 28 different uh, authors, and um, it covers the whole area of the whole vaccine issue. We've raised it before, and uh, I think it's one that's going to go on and go on and go on. But that's it from me. That brings us to the end of my part of this week's show, so uh, stay tuned for some more. Thank you. You're listening to The Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the irishsideofthemoon.ie. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information, personal empowerment. Okay, you're still here on the Irish side of the moon. That was Tommy in conversation with Dale Peterson. Very enjoyable, very interesting. Uh, I was looking forward to that one myself, and I definitely enjoyed it. And that's the end of Tommy's portion. We're going to put Tommy back in the box. And it's Michael stepping up uh, for the remainder of the show. There's two segments left on this week's show, and uh, I'm about to start off with the first of those. I'm in conversation and I have on the line right now, Ryan Stewart. Ryan, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good, glad to hear it. Ryan's name uh, will be familiar uh, to long-time listeners, uh, no matter what part of the world you're in, because if you remember, we had Ryan on the show before, in connection with the VRT story. We'll touch on that now in just a second, but that's not why Ryan is here today. Let's let's just do that straight away. Ryan, uh, quickly, briefly... 
Um, we had you on before in connection with VRT. Explain, as I say, some listeners are not in Ireland. They won't know a clue what we're chatting about. Um, what was that all about and how is it going? Um, well, it's going pretty well now, Michael. Um, the VRT situation was regarding vehicle registration tax. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a charge that's applied here in Ireland and several other European countries um, to varying degrees of severity. Um, within Ireland, um, basically what we've had in, in local areas is a crackdown by revenue officials where they're seizing vehicles where uh, vehicle registration tax hasn't been paid on them. Now, vehicle registration tax basically flies in the face of everything that we joined the EU for um, as regards free trade. Um, where there's where there aren't supposed to be taxes uh, between different jurisdictions when purchasing goods, um, it's it, basically in 1992 the Irish government changed it from uh, customs duty to a, nat- a national tax, which meant that the EU had no say so over it, um, and they continue to apply it today. Um, and what I'm campaigning for is to uh, basically abolish the tax, replace it with a usage-based system, which would lead to basically cheaper cars, um, but at the same time it would have certain uh, financial benefits and environmental benefits as well. One of the things that was really striking about uh, the campaign, and, and certainly last time we spoke to you, was the very fact that there was a large Facebook element and there was a large element of people coming together using Facebook as a method of communication, but really affecting a movement, uh, being able to uh, communicate with each other with regard to uh, certain hotspots and areas to go to. That was something that we found fascinating and something that we've heard about from different corners of the globe, both uh, large and small. Um, And that was something, I think, from speaking to you last time, that almost took you by surprise the way it ran uh, it up and ran itself almost, not not taking away from the effort you were putting into it. Yeah, but it, it, it took on a life of its own. I mean, it's sitting at the minute at 12,200 members, and that's just on Facebook alone. Um, you know, the with the differences in uh, internet access and that in this part of the country as well, um, it's surprising that the number of people who aren't actually part of the site, um, who haven't, you know, joined up as members, but they, they speak to me every day on the street when they see me. Um, you know, there's, there's literally tens of thousands of people out there behind this campaign. Um, but the Facebook element really, really mobilized people um, and it, it, it informed people as well. You know, people people knew the very basics of, of what I was campaigning for. Um, but as far as the law behind it and everything goes, um, they were very much in the dark um, because it was very hard to get a hold of uh, certain information. And mm. this, basically, this basically took on a life of its own. And um, very, very quickly, the word was spread around the country. I mean, I, I get phone calls every week from different areas of the country, whether they be in Donegal or in Cork. Um, so, you know, through that through that very simple Facebook system, um, the word got out there extremely fast. We spoke to a guy a couple of weeks on the show, a guy called Gerald Salente, an American, uh, highly regarded. And one of his things, uh, what he's been doing for the last 30 years odd, is forecasting global trends. And he talked a lot about this on the show, the idea that more and more uh, people know and realize they have more and more power and they're using things like Twitter and Facebook to accomplish the sort of things that you are accomplishing. And obviously the, the big buzzwords at the moment are Egypt and Tunisia because Actually, we yeah. saw yeah, we saw examples on a really large scale how much... The first thing they're switching off. Yes, because it's a threat. So they, they recognize the threat of it, like, you know. Exactly, Ryan, exactly. Okay, moving over from VRT, more or less. Uh, today, you're here to talk to us largely about uh, your own ca- personal campaign. ElectRyanStewart.com is the website, ElectRyanStewart.com. Um, tell us a little bit about the process that brought you uh, to this stage where you decided to, to stand up and uh, let your voice be heard. Um, well, there were a few factors in it. I mean, it didn't come to a decision easily. Um, mm. I've had quite a lot of thought into whether or not I would put my name forward for it. Um, I mean, the VRT campaign itself got huge support, um, massive public recognition as well, um, and also political recognition. Um, you know, to, to see where we've moved on from when I was last chatting to you, um, the EU have accepted two cases that have put forward now. Um, we also got the back and unanimous support um, from all parties uh, concerned in Donegal County Council, and that's been replicated through county councils across the country. Um, you know, back at the back at the start of this campaign, there were a number of people in different radio stations and that sort of, you know, saying that I was often a rocker actually standing up and doing this. Um, but it shows you the sort of impact that one person can have. 
And what I've what I've been trying to put forward basically is that you know more and more people should be standing up and you know pointing out where things are wrong. There was another protest in Letterkenny in Donegal there on Saturday, uh, which I was part of um, regarding carbon tax. Basically, it's another stealth tax. And, uh, you know, when people actually stand up and make a few waves, it gets attention. And I think that that's really what's been lacking in this country. And that's why we've seen our own constitution sold down the river. Um, not to mention the, you know, I mean, for example, we have the, we have the IMF in this country now. Um, the government that was elected had no mandate to do that. Um, they have eroded the constitution. And I think that what we need are more people like myself who basically will act sort of like watchdogs to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen in future. Um, so I, I put myself forward for election uh, for Dal Aaron. Um, a lot of people look at it as a single party candidate. Um, again, I have a lot more to offer than that. Um, and if people actually go onto the website, electrionstuart.com, they'll see the, the proposals that I have. I'm pretty well educated and I can, I can read situations. And um, basically with the debates that I've been having over the last uh, two weeks there in the run-up to this election, um, I think a lot of people are starting to realize that. You definitely, so it sounds like you definitely would completely advocate that other people, uh, when the opportunity presents itself in years ahead, would step forward and do the same thing. Uh, it, it, has it been a frustrating or an empowering experience? I know there are broad terms, but by and large, do you find it frustrating being out there trying to get your message across, or is it as um, empowering as, as, as the, the VRT situation was? I think it's a little bit of both. You, you have your good days and bad days, you know. Um, mm. I mean, from, from the VRT scenario, um, it's encouraged me because I... As I say, I've been getting phone calls every single week from different parts of the country regarding different situations, you know, and these are regular people. These are, you know, Joe Soap, Joe Public, um, who are running into difficulties with, with revenue and that, and they don't understand the full extent of the law. They don't know how to ties to them. And, you know, just even from simply helping them out or liaison with customs to try and sort out an issue with them, um, which is sort of where the rule has landed me. Um, you know, I might have been sort of bitten by the bug, and I want to. I want to represent people. I want to stand up for people, and uh, you know, put their best, put, put their best foot forward, and uh, make a bit of difference in, in this country. And I don't see why other people shouldn't do the same. Um, and Donegal North East, which is the constituency I'm running, and there are eleven candidates running for three seats. Five of those, including myself, are independents. Um, so I think people do realise that there is a need for change here in the country as regards how how their views are listened to, how party politics is viewed. Um, one of the big uh, so one of the big uh, criticisms that people up here would have is that we've had you know TDs elected from parties for the past God knows how many years, and we've got nothing back from it. Um, simply because what they're doing is they're they're serving as messenger boys for the for their party leadership and ultimately our county's actually lost out on it. So, you know, if, if people do come forward, if people do make a stand, make a make their case heard loudly, um, they will they will see the benefits of it. I mean th- there are the downsides as well and that, you know, people sort of criticize, well what can one person do? And I think that I've sort of disproven the myth that, you know, you're sort of helpless on your own. Uh, given the progress that I've made with the VRT campaign, um, anything I get my teeth into, I usually stick with it and I usually see it right through to the end, and that's what I plan on doing here as well. Well, that's something we see with a, a lot of the guests. In fact, the majority of guests we we have on the Irish side of the moon, they they always seem to be individuals with a vision. Whatever it happens to be, we've covered every topic from energy conservation to to you name it. We've we've covered health, alternative health. Uh, regimes and again it is when somebody really gets down to it it is amazing how much one person uh, can accomplish you mentioned change and that leads me nicely into the next two questions change and 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 how big of change is is possible a lot of guests that we've had on uh, we've looked at finance a lot on the show and some political people uh, looking at the global pictures and they advocate huge deconstruction huge change of the way the banking uh, system rules the world just to kind of, to kind of put it in, in, in the most graphic term as possible do you think yourself, you're out there and you're actually doing it do you think that the sort of changes that some of our guests have talked about are realistic, palatable do you think the time is coming where you will see a large group of, of politicians um, like yourself actually advocating the sort of radical changes that as I say some of our guests feel are absolutely necessary to unshackle us from the banking system, which pulls the strings on everything. 
I think what's happened, uh, particularly in Ireland, is that there has been too close an association with politicians and the banking system. I think that's that's mm. number one. That's the first issue that has to be addressed. Um, I think the other consideration we have to make is that the politicians here and there don't know enough about the banking sector. Um, I mean, basically what we have here, we have we live in a capitalist country. Um, United States is a capitalist country. Britain is a capitalist country. Um, but the fact is, is that capitalism failed, and it, it, it failed because the governments have let it fail. I mean, the principles of capitalism is that, you know, if you're going to invest money, if you're going to take a gamble, if it doesn't pay off, you lose out. Yeah. But what we've done is we've, we've given a blanket guarantee that uh, you will not lose. It's, it's sort of a, a perverted version of communism, if you, do, if you will. Um, so I, I, I think that it's, it's just simply down to a lack of understanding. And that's, that's, what, that's what's got us into this problem. I, I think so, yeah. I think everybody, you mentioned politicians, but I think nearly everybody is surprisingly ignorant, and I mean that in its literal sense, surprisingly ignorant of the facts of how banking works and the idea that when you get a loan, people assume it means one thing, but it actually means something completely different. And the average man and woman in the street is probably not aware of that. I think the average man in the street is learning a lot and have learned a lot over the last... Um, I mean, the differences that we see, I mean, take, for example, the, the, the burning question here, and burning is probably the right word to use, um, what do we do with the bondholders? Um, you know, people are saying, do we burn the bondholders? Do we not? Um, you know, will it collapse the system? Um, will it be in the best interest of the country? And the fact is that all of those answers are correct. Um, if, we, if we burn the bondholders, the question is, where do we get the money to run the country? Um, I mean, what we have to look at, the bondholders that we're thinking about burning have already sold on the debts that we owe them. It's, it's a much bigger picture than, you know, we owe them money. We don't owe them anything for starters because they were an absolute shock when, when we had the Minister for Finance phoning them up and saying, look, we're going to give you your money back, but it'll take a bit of time. They expected to lose that money. That's it's the game they're in. Um, you know, so it's, it's, hard, it's hard to see, you know, where we go from here. I, what I was putting forward was the fact that, well, first of all, we can't afford to repay that money. It wasn't our debt in the first place. We shouldn't have anything to do with it. And as far as running the country goes, there are other avenues than going to the bond markets. Um, we have a, a number of friendly nations that we can borrow off. We can use their credit ratings to actually borrow. Something which uh, Fine Gael actually just picked up the other day where they said they were getting $100 billion from the United States at 0% interest. That's never going to happen. And it, it's the typical sort of stunt that you would hear a week before an election. It's never going to happen. But what what could happen is we could get it at the two percent, not the not the not the six percent that we're paying now. So there are there are a number of solutions there and, and different you know, different ways out of out of the mess. But it's about, you know, sort of allaying the fears of those who are in charge at the moment because to be honest, the you know, when you have Brian Cowan sitting down with Sean Fitzpatrick at a hotel and saying that he never discussed the banking crisis. You know, Sean Fitzpatrick, the head of Anglo Irish Bank, which has got us into all this mess, and the other guests at the table were uh, at the table were chief economist. You know what that meeting was about, but it's, it's as I say, it's too much close personal interest between the between the governments and between the banking system. That's what's that's what's led us here. Mm, yeah. Moving on, more or less now to the to the last question I really have, and it's a kind of a two part question. Um, Again, on the area of change, uh, I find myself, and you said there yourself about the man in the street, the average man, socially, just as I uh, move around, going out, meeting people over the last year and a half that I've been involved with, with this project here in, in, in Donegal, I find myself meeting more and more people. Um, I was at a party a couple of weeks ago, towards the end of the night, wound up chatting with this lady, uh, uh, sitting in the kitchen, uh, very attractive lady, I was more than happy to spend the end of the night chatting to her, um, but <laughs> definitely, but she was... I can honestly say she was more knowledgeable on some of the subjects that we cover on the show and some of the guests. Now, she was vaguely aware. She had heard the name of our show because she had seen her friends posting it on, on Facebook, but she hadn't. She didn't know us then. But she knew all the information that, as I say, a lot of our guests. And that's what, what I find curious. You're out there. You're meeting people. What When you meet people on the doorsteps, when you chat to people, do you find that they really do know their stuff, that, or that a large percentage of them, compared to maybe five or ten years ago, know their stuff, and they have good questions for you, they have shrewd questions. Um, like, 
that's the two-part question. Do you find that? And part B of the question, what else is out there? What's the mood? What are you seeing? I, I understand from Chad to a few people who've been out with candidates that the picture out there is, can be quite grim um, at the moment. But uh, It can be. Um, mm. I mean, you do get you get a number of different questions answered or asked at every door. And, um, you know, I mean, from, from my own point of view with the VRT thing, you know, I've I've kind of got an advantage when I'm going up to knock on a door to speak to a potential voter than some of the other candidates do because if there's a northern red car in the driveway, I know yeah. where I'm going with that conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but as far as the, you know, the other issues there, um, you know, I, I get asked you know different questions about you know people's benefits. Um, you know, I'm up to my ears in debt uh, because of this mortgage. You know, what are we going to do? To, to sort out this, um, you know, jobs is obviously a massive issue in Donegal. Um, and then there's, you know, to answer both sides of the question, I suppose there's the question of sort of political reform, um, because some of the statements you get is that these are all the exact same. Um, I, I know for a fact I'm not, because I'm not one of them yet. Um, and then the question is, well, when you get in, you will be. Um, there's the serious sort of... Uh, there's a lot of really motivated and informed voters out there, and then there's others who have just completely switched off from the whole issue. Um, there's people who can't wait to get using their vote to really send a message to people, yep. and there's others who refuse to vote because they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, which is pretty sad now. It's, it's disappointing to hear that. But, uh, I mean, we do have a pretty fair system of voting in this country. Um, but you know, when you when you boil it down to political reform, uh, the the doll elections is one side of it. Um, but then you look at the other side of it, the Senate elections. Uh, our Senate is the the form of electing the Senate is as corrupt as they come. Mm. Oh yeah, uh, you know, yeah. You have you have Taoiseach's nominations and that. You know, where if you if you haven't done well in the election, you have a backup plan. You know, that's that's if people don't want you to represent them, they don't want you to represent them and the last thing they need is the teacher then having you given your message if the teacher comes along and says, Well sure and you go to the channel then and you can sit there for five years until the public mood changes. That's it's completely wrong, like um I mean there's there's people who've been saying, you know, about abolishing the channel and that. Um, you know, some people are misinformed as well about what we should do with the channel. Because they believe it, it is a corrupt mess, and I completely agree with that. But I think we need to reform the Senate rather than getting rid of it, so that it acts as a watchdog for what our main political representatives are doing. Um, so, I mean, if you had the Senate elections at the same time as the Dáil elections, you're going to get a fair result. You don't have any second chances. You run for either the Senate or the Dáil, and you don't have any Taoiseach nominations. So it's it's basically like an oversight committee. Mm. Um, that's that's basically where I see it going. Um, it's, it's just it's the disenchantment with some people, and then you know that's sort of this isn't the first question. You, know, you have your ups and downs. Disenchantment is at this point, um, but then you have really really motivated people who are really well informed who want to, who want the opportunity. And I mean, if you look at what's happening in Tunisia and in Egypt and in Iran and Bahrain and the, mm -hmm. the only reason it's not happening here is because we have the opportunity of an election now next week. You know, if, if if that was three four years down the line, I don't think people would be as placid. We've we've lost our fighting edge in Ireland. We don't stand up as much as we should. Um, but as I say, we have an opportunity now, and for people not to vote is is really a waste of a waste of a vote. You know, but I think people should use their message there. Yeah, well, it's fun, when you say that the, the piece there, a couple of guests that we've had on the show from outside Ireland, looking at the situation, looking in on Ireland. They expressed surprise to uh, myself and to, to Shane and Tommy um, that, that things haven't got more, um, I don't know if violent is the right word, but certainly more uh, people haven't got more visible and vocal. So it is it is strange, yeah, that, you know, because we are very close to the edge of that kind of um, activity. OK, we're, we're moving towards the end here. Elect ryanstewart.com that's where people should direct themselves if they're listening to you again obviously anyone who's listening locally and who's interested and wants to find out more about you um, your closing words closing message uh, again out there to somebody who vaguely knows you're out there and vaguely knows about the VRT if you're putting yourself on the map with that person right now in the closing days uh, what would you say to them about yourself and what you would like to do or what you would like to get out there as a message um, what I would like to say to people out there, if, if they're still undecided, or even if they have decided, um, is to look closer at what you're actually voting for. Um, you know, see through the false promises and the and the lies that you're being told on the doorsteps, um, because it's it's an election week. 
you're going to get it. Um, you know, just they promise you the sun, moon, and the stars in the doorstep. But if you actually look at the manifestos, it's it's not on par with what they're telling you at the doorstep. I set my cards out very early. Um, I I my website's up and going for the last few months there. Um, so there's no bandwagons I'm jumping on. I I know where to stand. Um, and I just hope that people, if if you aren't informed yet, get informed. Look at who you're voting for. Find out the full picture before you actually make up your mind. And at the end of the day, hopefully I'll get a first preference vote from them or somewhere on the ticket anyway. I think it's time for a really change in this country and that's something that I want to deliver. Excellent. I mean, that sentiment there, the sentiment of, of educating yourself and finding out, we hear that from all our guests with regard to every topic. And certainly a topic like this, politics on our own doorstep, uh, the words could not be more true, Ryan. It's, it's very important so that people... Important. It is, yeah, it's yeah. the most important election we've had for decades. The saddest thing is the apathy. You mentioned it there in, in a few minutes yes. back. It is the saddest thing. I, I find it sad myself. I think back of, of our fathers and, and our, our grandfathers and what they accomplished. It's sad to think that anyone at this stage would be... I know we're all jaded and disillusioned, but to be apathetic at this stage is quite sad. There's, there is a way forward for it. There has to be... or. Otherwise, it, it's it's just too disheartening. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much for your time. I do wish you success in these closing days, and I hope you continue to get your message out there. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Michael. And stay with us on the other side of the moon. We're going to have a short break, and we're coming right back. Uh, I'm going to be in conversation with Robin Wilson. So stay with us on the Irish side of the moon. You're listening to The Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the irishsideofthemoon.ie. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information, personal empowerment. Okay, you're still with us here on the other side of the moon. That was Ryan Stewart. Uh, it was good to talk to Ryan again. He's been with us before, and I'm sure our paths will cross again in the near future. Moving on, moving on to the uh, last segment of this week's show, I have on the line right now uh, a gentleman from a different part of the country. I'm based uh, in Donegal, but this gentleman is actually uh, down down in Louth, Mr. Robin. Wilson, you're very welcome yeah, how you doing, Michael? to the Irish Side of the Moon. Thank you for making time for us this afternoon. Okay, so tell me. Oh, you're very, very welcome to the show. Right, first question, first the most basic question. What brings you into this fray? What made you decide to stand up and make your voice heard on the political scene? Well, I'll tell you what it is, Michael. Uh, I haven't been involved in politics before, but uh, like like half the country, I've, I've kind of been aghast at... Uh, some of the decisions the government has made mm. uh, in relation to the, the accepting the liability for the for the banking gambles that didn't work out, and uh, then accepting the terms of this bailout, which led directly from the banking gambles. Uh, so I I just felt I had to do something myself about it uh, because none of the main parties seem to be addressing the major problems. And do you think it's been a positive experience for you? Would you tell someone else listening to you? that in general, standing up, getting that message out, it's been worth your time and effort. Has it been positive? Has it been frustrating? Uh, it's been positive, yeah. No, I'd recommend it to anybody uh, to give it a shot if it's something they they sort of feel, feel compelled to do. Um, I've raised an awful lot of issues uh, in this election that other people haven't raised, other people haven't thought of. And whether or not I get elected, uh, that will have made some sort of impact and it will colour how people uh, look at some of the issues. So, you're saying, uh, and you're saying your background wasn't in politics before you got into no, the... No, not you at were all. Just, you were in business originally, is that correct? You're, yeah, that's business, right. I was yeah. self-employed till the start of the recession. Hmm. Uh, I was a publican and uh, before that I ran a club and before that I was a project manager. I've, uh, I've had a lot of different uh, different experiences. So you've been dealing with the public all along, so you're well used to that, that aspect of things, chatting to people yeah, and, absolutely, yeah. and listening to people. Obviously, that's a big skill when you're a Republican, I know, from having oh, family members. So you, have to, you, have to, you have to listen to some amount of things, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> so you decide to take this step. Uh, at what stage did you decide to, to, to get involved? Like how, how far back did you decide, right, this is for me, I'm going to put my name on the ticket? Um, 
Well, I suppose around uh, last September, October, uh, I kind of put some thoughts down of uh, what, you know, what wasn't, there wasn't a party addressing what I thought should be addressed. So I put a few notes down on paper and uh, set up an outline of a party called uh, Autonomy Ireland, uh, which had five sort of basic principles. Now, I didn't unfortunately get it uh, registered in time for this election. So that's why I ran as an independent. But uh, from the feedback I've got from that, I'll, I'll probably plug away at it uh, after this election, even if I'm not elected, you know. Okay, yeah, you, so you got, you, you're working from a bigger picture. You obviously, you have an idea. Yeah. Uh, this is a step. This election is a step towards something that you're going to keep doing, which is which makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, maybe, certainly from the, certainly, I mean, before the election, I, I just sort of felt compelled to uh, to have a go at it. Um, but from the response I've got, uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to bring it a wee bit further, yeah. Um, we yeah, find... I, go on, yeah. Sorry, no, no, go on. I was finished there, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, we find on the show, where we on Irish Side of the Moon now, we've dealt with a lot of different topics, we've dealt with a lot of different guests, and the show airs around the world, it's not just, it's, we're based in Ireland, but we produce from Ireland. Yeah. And sometimes we end up veering into the area of politics and finance, because it's one of the pet projects, it's something that is on everybody's lips. A lot of the guests that we have had on, people who have talked about finance, people like Bill Still, people who really know the finance and, and, and yeah, the yeah. thing, they advocate some major radical deconstruction and reorganization of the whole banking system. And a lot can be said to to blame the, the banks for everything that's going on, that they really are the yeah. masters behind everything. How practical, here's the question, how practical do you think it is, you're out there, you're on the doorsteps chatting to people, to put across a message like that where you say to people, there's going to be a lot of hard work and a major reorganization of the system. It's not just enough to change the players in the system, but the system itself needs to be deconstructed. How 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 easy does it to get that message across, do you think, out there? Well, uh, you really need a, a very specialized plan for that, you know. Um, a lot of people agree with the, with the theory of that. Uh, but they can see that it's going to be a very hard thing to do, particularly when uh, capital that was frittered away on Anglo-Irish Bank is that, that the, the gambles that were frittered away on uh, Anglo-Irish Bank are being uh, fully reimbursed. It, it, it kind of makes people a bit despondent when they see things like that. Yeah, because we're footing the bill, of course, yeah. Do you find... Do you find, and I, and I find myself, I find socially, never mind in the area of politics, but even just as you meet people when you're out, that more and more people are very well read and very, very well versed in, in some of the topics, again, we cover on there, said them in. there are people out there who have, have read the books. I met somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. at the party. Yeah, they, they, they know more about this stuff than I do, and I'm not being falsely modest. I mean, sincerely, I, I cross paths with people. Uh, every few weeks I meet a friend of a friend of a friend, somebody, and they really blow me away because they're reading into alternative ideas and they're really concerned and really eager to see changes here in the country and changes in Absolutely. the city. Do you find that when you chat to people? Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, and it really does give you hope. Uh, people, are, people are very well informed. They're not just, uh, you know, they're, they're not just in a routine of, of uh, EastEnders and Fair City and the news and then the same all over again the next day. People are actually very uh, genuinely concerned about things that are happening and they're, they're empowering themselves by by uh, reading up on it. Uh, of course, the internet's been a great help for that. Uh, yes, for yes, of course. Yeah, And you see it globally with Egypt, Tunisia, you see it with Bahrain, you see it globally, the impact the internet can have. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, like one, of my, uh, one of my things on the doorsteps is uh, explaining to people that, you know, about the IMF, what they actually are. Uh, with, with the name International Monetary Fund, you know, people seem to think there's some sort of uh, department of the UN that, you know, some sort of virtual charity, when, of course, uh, they're very much the opposite. They're asset strippers. And uh, I, f I find that, I thought I'd have to start from scratch explaining this to people, but a lot of people already know it. And they've been wondering why are our... Uh, why are our government accepting them coming into the country, you know? I mean, yeah, we've got major financial problems, but at the end of the day, if you say, no, we're not interested, 
something else has to come up, you know. The IMF, um, Gabriel, one of the other guys here on the team, um, that's one of his pet things as well. He, he's always, there's a documentary out there about the Argentina situation, and I, I must admit I haven't gone around to watching yet, but Gabriel talks about that a lot and the horrendous things that they have done, which parallel what's probably yeah. going to happen here in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, like I say, they're asset strippers. Uh, when the IMF moves into a country, uh, you there's one question you have to ask yourself, and that is, uh, what do they want out of it? Why? What are they after that they're going in in the first place? Uh, virtually every country that get that gets an IMF loan uh, at, at exorbitant rates, they can't repay, repay, and then they default. They've generally got some sort of natural resource that's covered by the um, by the IMF or by some of the some of their clients' corporations. Now, <clears throat> in our case, uh, a lot of people don't know, but we've got a, an oil field called Dunquin off the coast of Kerry. And uh, in two years' time, it's ready to start pumping. The platform's already there. Uh, Exxon Mobil, Statoil. And it's got an estimated 4 billion barrels of oil, which is $400 billion. Now, the IMF happens to have moved in two years before this oil is starting to flow, which means they decide how it gets taxed. And uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to get it across to people that whether it's coincidence they're here or whether it's by design, it's not really the point. The point is we have to maintain our sovereignty uh, for the next, certainly for the next few years. But we have to maintain our so sovereignty always, obviously. But it's essential at the moment that the IMF does not get control of this country because our oil will be given away and there will still be austerity here. And again, you say, you make a great point there. I mean, it doesn't matter, realistically, whether it's by accident or by design. We, yeah, we yeah, never... I mean, you could, I mean you, could, you could waste your time getting into conspiracy theories. Yes. It's not really the point. Agreed. It's not really the point. I'm not, I'm not coming from a position of conspiracy theory. I'm coming from a position of the IMF are after something when they come in and offer you help. And in our case, I believe that's what it is. Uh, it's the New York Times said we've got about eight billion barrels of oil in the Atlantic margin. Our own government reckons about uh, ten billion. At a hundred billion barrels, at a hundred dollars a barrel, you're talking about a trillion dollars worth of oil, all coming on stream in the next few years because it's, it's been confirmed and found. We don't read about this in the mainstream media, but it's there. It's, on the internet, you can find it. The facts are there, and it's in newspapers as well, if you know where to look. So uh, it'll be an absolute, an absolute tragedy if, uh, if we were to lose these resources for the sake of a $65 billion loan, sorry, euro loan, that's been designed for us not to be able to pay back. Mm. And you make a great point there about the mainstream, of course, because the picture emerges the more you study it, that, that the mainstream media in this country is very much a, a, a promotional tool for whatever party is in government, and they're not likely to put messages out there that are going to um, go contrary to their long-term plans, whatever they happen to be. So you do have to go to the internet, and you do have to go to alternative media to find yeah. and educate yourself. You find that, and do you find, again, I, I'm repeating the question, but do you find people are out there and they are receptive to these things? You're on Facebook, for instance. I know you're on Facebook. Like, do you yeah, find that right, yeah. that's a good way for communication? Do people reach out to you on your page, etc.? And how does that work? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, when I set up the Autonomy Ireland website, uh, you know, I, I I put very clearly what the the aims of the movement were, were uh, to achieve sovereignty and so on, and develop, exploit our natural resources for ourselves. Uh, and you know, it's uh, as, as soon as you put it out there. Like-minded people just gravitate towards it. Uh, you only have to click with a, with a couple of people, and then friends of theirs who are of a similar mind, they get involved, and then their friends look at it on their page, and then they get involved. Yeah, I well, found that. Yeah, I found that that's how it works. Again, from chat to people, people recommend a book, people recommend a website, people recommend something, and a YouTube clip, whatever it is, and it strikes a chord. What's your What's the address? You were saying the the website is set up. Uh, give out the. I'll add it to the uh, our own website at the end. Can you just call it out for people who want to track you down online? Yeah, um, on Facebook we're on uh, Autonomy Ireland. 
uh, and for the election, I shortened it to Autonomy IRE and then Robin Wilson, uh, because, I'm, uh, like I say, I have to stand as an independent in this uh, election. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, with regard to the election, with regard to you standing, as we move into the last couple of minutes of the show, um, sure. any key message that you feel right? Somebody is out there, and obviously you're based out, obviously people listening around the world, but uh, hopefully as well you've, you've got we've got listenership in, in Louth in your own area and you'll have this link you can you can uh, obviously share it on this segment etc people listening to this uh, they're on the fence they're wondering what you're all about what would you say to them now you, that you can really kind of set a light off or set some switch going where they can kind of say right I can be on the same page as Robin Wilson what would you say to them in these closing minutes well in terms of the uh whether it's voting for myself or voting for independence, I'd say this. Uh, our economy's been run for the last two years by the European Central Bank. Uh, Brian Lennon, everything he's done has been dictated to him. Every explanation he's given has been dictated to him by people in Frankfurt. And the same people have sat down uh, with our, our own uh, opposition parties. So they're all kind of singing off the same hymn sheet. We have to accept this bailout. We have to accept uh, bank debt. I'd say vote for any dissenting voice that uh, uh, if there's an independent in your constituency who says we're going completely down the wrong track, the fact that a couple of a couple of people in our political elite have been bullied into doing the wrong thing doesn't mean we have to go along with it. Uh, so, you know, I'd say uh, if, if there are people like that in your constituency, uh, support them. That's a good closing message. And before I let you go, just as, as a more of a follow-on, I, I, from hearing some stories of, of, of people who have been out on, on the campaign trail, it's quite bleak out there. There's, there's houses where there might be only heat in one room. I'm hearing of children yeah. wrapped in, 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 in duvets in, one, in a room conserving money on heat. People, uh, one story I heard, um, somebody uh, in a house, the house is not finished, can't afford to finish the building, but still has to live in the remaining rooms. I mean, yeah. are you seeing some things that, that just are horrific out there at the moment in your own constituency. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. I mean, I, you, you know that exists, but at the same time, people try and put a brave face in their own situation. You know. Yeah, when you see it in uh, your own doorstep, it's it is crazy. Like when I hear about that, and I think, God, that it's only down the road. Yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. Horrible, like that. It, it 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 shouldn't make it more horrible because it's close by. But it actually does. Yeah. The human element does yeah. make, it, make us connect with it more when we know someone Absolutely. knows someone who's in that position. Yeah. Especially when you can remember them three or four years ago, and things are so different. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It is. It is. It is pretty hard now. Okay. So your message is fairly clear cut. You're you're optimistic. You're glad that you stopped stepped out there. You're encouraging. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. You're encouraging people, as you say, to look for the dissenting voice because everyone else is singing off the same hymn. Uh, hymn sheet they're singing the same song we have to do this we have to accept the debt and you are one of exactly, the people yeah. across the people and there are a lot of independents out there um, and you're all kind of saying um, you know it doesn't have to be that way exactly yeah and I'm not being a dissenting voice for the sake of being a dissenting voice uh, what, I, what I've seen happen is just blatantly wrong people of a nation are not held liable for gambles by foreign banks on their private banks, it, it's it's just totally wrong. It's 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 a precedent, and why should we be setting that precedent by accepting it? And everything that's happened since then has flowed from that. If the banking debt wasn't there, our sovereign debt would be would be at a normal size, and we could borrow from bond markets. But because the European Central Bank imposed this on us, we were dependent on them for funding, and they hit us with this bailout plan, which we can never pay back. Uh, we're in a trap, and we have to get out of it. Robin Wilson, thank you very much for making time to speak with us on the Irish side of the moon. You're very welcome, Michael. Thanks very much for your time. We are Irish side of the moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish side of the moon. I still have a dream. This is just a ride. ride, ride, ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's all a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now between fear and love. Love, love. Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.